In our last episode, we tried to get the Brotherhood of Steel to help us build a signal interceptor so we could infiltrate the Institute. But they had us jump through all sorts of hoops before they'd even talk to us. First we had to become a member, then we had to fly to the Pridwin and talk to Maxon, and then he had us meet all of the officers, and then we became a knight, which is great, and we got some power armor. But just when we thought they were going to help us, Arthur Maxon tells us that he first needs us to go to nearby Fort Strong, kill all the super mutants there, because mutants are abominations, and recover a bunch of fat man shells, or mini nukes, as we know them. And then, maybe, we'll be able to build that signal interceptor. And so, after being encouraged to help out by our companions, we hopped aboard a vertibird and headed towards Fort Strong. Welcome aboard, Knight. Instruments are green, and we're cleared for release. We see laser fire on the ground below us, but it would be a mistake to start shooting now. Those are actually Brotherhood soldiers engaged in target practice. Having the Pridwin moored above the airport keeps the Brotherhood within striking distance of the city. And yeah, shooting on them at this point would have been bad. The Vertibird turns east, and we fly by Nordhagen Beach. We see that Nordhagen Beach attaches to Fort Strong via a short bridge. And as we fly, we pass by some Mirelurks beneath us, so we can waste some ammo. Target acquired. I'll try and keep him in your sights. We arrive at Fort Strong and immediately come under fire. There appears to be a small town built just outside of Fort Strong, and the super mutants have infested it. But in the middle of town... Oh, it's a super mutant behemoth, and he's hurling huge rocks at us. The rocks do make contact with the vertebrate and cause the vertebrate damage. This isn't just a scripted event. We've got to focus our fire on this behemoth. If we don't, it's possible for the behemoth to knock us out of the sky and we die. But this does take a very long time, and assuming we don't lollygag, the vertebrate will circle the town outside of Fort Strong, and we can focus our fire. After a while, the behemoth is bound to go down. Primary target down. Look at that thing, please. I'm going to find a place to set her down, and then hightail it back to the Fredwin for repair. The vertebrate begins to land, but there are still super mutants out there. The vertebrate's minigun's ammo is free, so we'll use up as much of this as we can before we disembark. Well, we've killed everyone we can. This guy is really good at taking cover, so we have to run forward to kill him. And with that, the mutants are dead, and our vertebrate takes off to get some repairs. We have secured Fort Strong. Well, the outside of Fort Strong, anyway. Dance is joining us for this mission, and now it's just us and Fort Strong. All other vertebrates have left. We can take some time to loot the bodies and loot this ruined town. But the town is bereft of much value. Each of these houses is small and many of them are filled with toxic radioactive barrels. We don't find any beds or containers or anything that gives us the impression that people at one time lived here. What kind of town was this? At length we find the body of the behemoth and we can loot it. Proceed carefully. These fortifications may still be inhabited. Behemoths carry a whole bunch of junk, and we can walk away with some great stuff. Of note, this guy was carrying a metal helmet, and oddly enough, this post-apocalyptic metal helmet was better than my army helmet. 
It had one less damage resist and plus four energy resist. That's a net total of three points, so I swapped it. We see that the mutants took down one vertebrate. There's a Brotherhood body lying nearby. Really, all we find of note in this town is in an open dumpster near to a ruined house. Here we find a charge card. This charge card really has no value in the game, though it does unlock some interesting dialogue from a few merchants. We'll learn more about the charge cards if we happen upon the swindler named Parker Quinn. And I did an entire video dedicated to him that you can watch here. And when we've completed searching each and every one of these buildings, which was a complete waste of time, there was nothing of value inside, we can climb the hill to the exterior of Fort Strong. Just to the northeast, we find an elevated area. We see some vases and cannons set up here. Here we find cannonballs, and if we had a weapon that used cannonballs as ammunition, this would be a great place to go to to find that very rare cannonball ammunition. Back to the fort, we see a sign outside covered in ivy. U.S. Army, Fort Strong. We see the door before us, but there's a path to the right. This leads to an area behind the fort. There's a plaque outside, but we can't read it. Another one next to some stairs that we can't read. Another one next to an ammo box on the ground with a lantern on top that we can't read. There's some miscellaneous scrap and more cannons here with even more cannonballs. Fort Strong is a must-hit place if we happen to have a weapon that uses cannonballs as ammunition. But when we are ready, we can head to the front door and enter the Fort Strong Armory. Watch your step. There's Don't quite a bit of debris here. here. We arrive in a lobby area with blood bags, shopping carts, and piles of blood all over the ground. The balcony ahead of us is crumbling to the floor below. We see two paths forward, a door to the north and a door behind us to the south. The one to the south is locked with a novice lock. We can pick this and we find a mutant. The commotion alerted a mutant behind us, and he comes from the door to the north. Oh, there you are! What the hell with you? <laughs> Go ahead and hide, little bleeder! Remember to get You Mission accomplished. Are you about to stop the locking mode? Standing down. With these mutants dead, we can turn around and explore this room to the south first. It appears to be an office space. After looting the bodies, we see a desk with some blasted out computers. There is a novice locked door in the southern wall of this room. This leads to another office space. This must have been the commander's office. Here we find an end of dungeon steamer trunk with lots of goodies inside, a mini nuke sitting in a display case, and on the desk is a copy of US Covert Operations Manual. Hell yeah. Who goes there? Permanently more difficult to detect while sneaking. In the desk is the Fort Strong key, and on the desk is General Brock's terminal. Fort Strong U.S. Army Depot, no unauthorized personnel. We find six entries in the first General Brock's report, June 2075. As of today, Command of Fort Strong has passed to me. I'm looking forward to helping the U.S. Army test some of its experimental weapon systems at our facility. I've already had the men preparing the island for testing operations by tearing down the old barracks and constructing a simulated town. Since we'll be fighting the enemy on an urban front, I think the best way to test these weapons is by seeing how well they'll punch through civilian structures. Oh, that explains why we didn't find any beds or loot or any signs of people actually having lived in the town that we explored. It was a simulated town used to test their experimental weapon systems. In the next one, September 2075, we've been testing the new batch of T-51B power armor suits that the Army Corps of Engineers just rolled off the assembly line. I'm impressed with the amount of protection they afford our soldiers, yet allow them a great deal of mobility. I've noticed that the soldiers are still having trouble jumping in these things. Because of the suit's weight, they often tip over on hard landings. I've had the maintenance boys look at it, and they're suggesting adding a gyroscope and shock absorbers to the lower torso. I'll pass it up the chain and see if I can get Washington to spend the extra money it'll cost for the modification. Oh, wow. They tested the T-51B suits here at Fort Strong. 
Since the T-51B suits won America, the battle for Anchorage, this was quite a consequential testing facility. And the next one, February 2076, things are starting to heat up overseas, so Washington is pushing us to cut our project turnaround times in half. I told them that would be dangerous, but it seems like we don't have much of a choice. I've decided to split my staff into Alpha Team and Bravo Team so we can work on two projects at the same time. The manpower will still be reduced, but I'm convinced that we'll still be able to maintain our new schedule. I'm going to put Alpha Team on the power armor and Bravo on the new M42 Fat Man launchers. Fat Man launchers were tested here too? Wow. This guy was in charge of some pretty important evaluations. In the next one, June 2076, Alpha Team just shipped out the first batch of T-51B suits to the front in China. Reports are already coming in that the suits are performing better than expected, chewing through enemy tanks and armor like they were paper. Word has it that some of the enemy troops are even surrendering when they catch sight of the power armor troops hauling their 5mm miniguns. Looks like the Alpha Team has earned themselves a weekend pass in Boston. That's right, it's because America had power armor that China was surrendering en masse like this and had such a hard time in Anchorage. Which is why a communist Chinese-themed version of power armor just wouldn't exist in this universe. Otherwise, this terminal wouldn't make sense. <clears throat> Fallen 76, Adam Shop. <clears throat> and the next one, December 2076. Bravo team is having a heck of a time getting the M42s not to shoot far enough away from its firing position. The problem is that the warhead is still too heavy to fire the distance required. Our simulated soldiers are still soaking far too many rads and suffering blast burns. One of the technicians has suggested a radical idea of using a conventional depleting subcharge to catapult the round rapidly out of the launcher. His calculations look sound, so I'm going to let him give it a try. In the next one, September 2077. After a few design setbacks and the loss of one of our testing squads, we've finally perfected the M42 launcher's firing mechanism. Washington has been riding me to wrap this project up, but with a weapon this potent, I was inclined to take my time. We've sent the launchers ahead to the supply yard in Mississippi, and we're just waiting for the go-ahead to ship the warheads wherever they need to go. Hopefully, we can get those nukes out of here before the month is out. I don't feel comfortable sleeping 20 feet above enough nukes to reduce this island to ash. Ooh. Well, this was in September of 2077. Did they get a chance to ship out those nukes before the world ended, or are they all still here? Backing out of the terminal, we can use the key we found in the desk to unlock the safe behind him. Otherwise, it's a master lock, and inside we find a bunch of ammunition. Heading out the door back into the other room, we can turn right. We find more cubicles and desks, some ammunition canisters on a desk, mentats on a filing cabinet. But moving forward, we find a hallway to the north and a door to the right. Moving down the hallway first, we find a bathroom to the left. There's a skeleton on the ground with a plunger in hand and a gas mask next to him. There's a first aid kit on the ground, beer bottles in the sink, and a baseball glove in the toilet. Continuing down the hallway, we see that this is the area that the balcony above was crumbling into. Both paths are inaccessible. But continuing forward, we find an elevator to the right, a room to the right, but this hallway circles back around to the left. We see a room in front of us and, ah, this brings us back to the entrance. We've done a full circle. Okay, now to explore the rest of these rooms. The latest room that we passed is another office cubicle room, and here we find more mutants. <laughs> There are desks, shelves, filing cabinets, all sorts of goodies lying here. And on one of the desks, we find a holotape, Private Murnahan's holotape. Word came down that the Army just unloaded the first batch of the uh, M42s this morning. I've only seen the specs for these little beauties on paper, so Private Bertram and I snuck down to take an early look. When I heard that the eggheads were designing a man portable nuke launcher, I thought they were nuts they actually got the damn thing to work. And after seeing the real thing sitting right in front of me, I think they could be just enough to tip the balance of this war in our favor. I mean, can you imagine the look on the enemy's face when we get dropped into Anchorage carrying these babies? They won't know what hit them.
Yes, I imagine the T-51Bs coupled with these were a potent combination. Most of the glory of America's victory went to the T-51Bs, but I'm sure the Fat Man launchers did their work as well. Exploring the rest of these desks doesn't reveal much. We can move out of this room through a break in the wall to the east, and this leads to the kitchen. Minor scrap in here, a few foodstuffs, not much else. Out of the kitchen, we arrive in the mess hall. There is an Itotronic on the wall with moldy food inside, a Nuka-Cola machine with a Nuka-Cola cherry inside, and then tables bedecked with food trays and silverware. No lore, no goodies. Out of the galley, through a door to the west, we arrive back in the hallway. Nearby, we find a display case on the wall. Baseball, 176 years of Boston tradition. Here we find a few baseballs on display. Looks like the military was really proud of their baseball team. Turning around, we see the elevator that we passed, but there was at least one room we still had to explore. So going all the way back, we can move into that room to see that a floor above has collapsed down into it. It appears to be a briefing room with a small stage and a microphone on the ground. In the podium, we find a bottle of whiskey and there's a cooler on the ground. I'm sure with a jetpack, it would be really easy to jump up into the room above, but I didn't have one, and so I tried to shimmy. But shimmying worked. I managed to get up there. Quite a bit of trash to pick through here. Searching through it could prove beneficial. You got it, Dance. I'll pick through all of this. We see that the floor above was a barracks. There are bunk beds here and empty footlockers. Skirting around the walls, we can try to move over to this door. Oh, but looking through the bunk beds, we see a footlocker that I missed. And there's a bunk bed in my way, but we can leap over it. And there we go. Just some ammunition inside. So squeezing our way back around, we can open this broken door. To arrive in a room that we can actually walk on. There are lockers here and boxes. It's all empty. There's a door to the west, which leads to another big barracks. More footlockers filled with ammunition, some rat away, a few containers, a cap stash and a locker, purified water on a cabinet, and a couple more containers to loot. Out of this barracks, we can turn to the room to the north, but this door won't open. This is directly beneath the balcony that collapsed into the hallway below. So with this top floor explored, we can hop back down, and that leaves only the elevator left to explore. So heading that way, we can open the elevator and take it down. At the bottom, the elevator door opens, leading to their research facility. There's a room to the left that's empty, and we find plenty of evidence of super mutant activity here. Skeletons, gore bags, and viscera everywhere. Out the eastern door, we arrive in a hallway with a room to the left and a room to the right. Going into the room to the left first, we find a bit of a workshop, lots of containers and scrap, an armor workbench, a first aid kit on the wall, and a door leading out to a bigger room directly in front of us. But before we explore that room, we can back out and return to the hallway. To the right is a restroom. Inside the restroom, we find a couple of mirror cabinets we can explore, two stalls, one of which is closed, and in the closed stall, uh, purified water? Judging from the amount of dust present, it's safe to assume we're the first people to investigate this location in quite a while. So you say, Dance, but uh, someone placed this purified water on the toilet, and in the other toilet we find dirty water. Oh, well, I guess we'll take the purified water. Thanks, whoever left this here. Back in the hallway, we find bones in a ruined terminal, and this hallway leads out to the same room we saw from the other room. There it is, to the left. Huh? What's that? This equipment's here for a reason. Let's find out why. And we hear the sound of mutants below us. Turning around and creeping down the stairs, we can try to get a jump on them. Here's playing tricks on me again. We may have a problem. Aha! Gotcha! We've got cover! It took me a while to clear this room because those mutants patrol with missile launchers. I managed to get off some sneak criticals to kill them quickly, but in previous attempts, I died numerous times to the missile launchers. But it looks like these are the last guys. So even though we haven't found the mini nukes yet, Paladin Dance takes us aside to congratulate us. Look at this place. You must hate these mutants as much as I do. Why do you hate super mutants so much? Hate's too gentle a word. 
But if we pass the charisma check... They're responsible for the death of a close friend, a brotherhood knight named Cutler. So when you ask if I hate them, I say hate's too gentle a word. I was just doing what Elder Maxon asked. No more, no less. Well, it's good to see you dealt with them the Brotherhood way. They're no different from anyone else. Have you taken leave of your senses? Absolutely. Wiping them out was a pleasure. I wish all of mankind shared your sentiment. These monstrosities are just another example of man blindly taking a step forward, only to wind up stumbling two steps back. I've been fighting for years, trying to put a stop to this madness. And just when I thought we were getting the upper hand, along come the synths. I've seen what these super mutants do to people. Can you imagine what the synths would do to us if they ever got the upper hand? It would be Armageddon repeated, and maybe the end of everything that we hold dear. <sighs> Look, I don't mean to bore you with my rhetoric. I just want you to understand how important these missions are. How could synths bring about our destruction? If the synths reached the point where they outnumbered mankind, how long would it take for them to decide we were no longer necessary? They certainly possess the capability to make more of their own kind, so we'd become expendable. And with Institute technology on their side, nothing could stop them. Not even the Brotherhood. It's a nightmare scenario almost too terrible to contemplate. Enough preaching already. I get it. Hmm. I suppose you're right. And judging from the corpses around here, you don't appear to need much in the way of motivation. Don't apologize. It reminds me why I'm doing this. Thank you, brother. It's good to know you're taking my advice to heart. Makes sense. Anyway, that's enough of that. What's important here is that you got the job done and secured these warheads. You should head back up to the Pridwin and talk to Maxon. I'm sure he'll want to debrief you as soon as possible. Dismissed. With that, Dance heads out, but I wanted to see if I could find these Fat Man shells. So heading down to the bottom floor, we can explore. There's lots of stuff everywhere. We'll start with the room to our right, which is a hallway that turns into a room to the east. Here we find computer consoles, some buff out on a table with some boxes nearby. This leads to a room to the north with minor scrap and a few containers, which just leads back out into the big room. We can loot the super mutant blood bags and the bodies lying all over the place. The only way out of this room, besides the way we came in, is down the hallway to the north. Here we find a room to the right with a terminal inside. This is the Bravo Team testing terminal. Inside we find five entries. Bravo Team M42 reports number one. Things are getting tough around here. Brock has decided to split our men into two teams. I drew one of the short straws, so I ended up on the M42 Fat Man Launcher Team, while most of my buddies are sitting pretty upstairs with their T-51B suits. I can't even begin to describe what a ridiculous idea the M42 is. A man-made portable mini-nuke thrower that a trooper in the field is supposed to deploy at close range? I've been poring over the schematics and I have no idea how we're going to get this thing to throw a warhead far enough not to kill the soldier unlucky enough to be stuck with these death traps. In the next one, number two, we've stripped the warhead weight down as much as possible, but I think we are looking at this the wrong way. Instead of trying to reduce the warhead weight, we should try and amp the power on the thrower itself. I know that means adding weight to an already heavy piece of ordnance, but I don't think we have any choice. One of the guys suggested we try magnetics to push the warhead through like a railgun, but the power pack would need to be the size of a suitcase. I'll keep picking away at this problem and see what I can turn up. In number three, we lost two good soldiers this morning. They were on the surface testing a MIRV variant of the launcher when one of the warheads misfired and hit the ground right where they were standing. Poor bastards didn't even have a chance. We couldn't even find any remains to send home to their folks, so Brock told us to just fill some cans with sand. I'll tell you, that guy doesn't give a crap about us. He's just worried about the brass back in Washington giving him a hard time. The MIRV variant, as many of us already know, shoots multiple mini-nuke warheads at once. In the next one, number four, I was in bed last night when I had one of those Eureka moments. I ran over to the night shift guys in the lab, swept all of their drawings on the floor, and started sketching my idea. They must have thought I'd lost my mind. Six hours and about 14 cups of coffee later, and I had it all mapped out. We'd use a small subcharge as a launching catalyst to catapult the warhead from the launcher. 
we'd have plenty of range and the subcharge could be built into the warhead itself. Brock seemed to like the plan and gave us the go-ahead to prototype the device. I can't wait to try it out. And in the final one, number five. It took the better part of a year and over a hundred test firings, but the M42 is ready to be shipped out into the field. I can't believe I spent over a year on this single project. I feel pretty good knowing we're delivering a well-tested weapon to our own guys fighting overseas. Now that it's over, I suppose Brock will move us on to something else, but for now, I'm gonna spend the rest of the month packing up these warheads to ship off base. It's amazing to think that an entire nation's success on the battlefield is in part due to one man's eureka moment. But I suppose many things in life are like that. After looting some medics in this room, we can return to the hallway, continue down, and then move into a room to the west. Here we find some rad X and a minor scrap back out into the hallway. We can follow it around and loot some bodies along the way. This leads to a room with a couple of mini nukes on a shelf. There is a case on a cart filled with mini nuke parts. An opened caged area to the right with a first aid kit and an ammo box inside and a balcony overlooking a huge room filled with crates of mini nukes. Wow, I can see why the Brotherhood wanted to come here. It's a shame that Dance walked off after our conversation because he actually has something to say if we walk into this room. Can you imagine these weapons in the hands of those super mutants? Oh my, bit nerve-wracking, isn't it? Being around so many weapons of devastation. We find a staircase to the right that brings us down to this lower area. And look at all that ordnance. Sadly, we can't loot any of these containers for mini nukes to use ourselves. They're all closed. So, at this point, all we can do is turn around and head out of Fort Strong. Oddly enough, if we come back here after completing the quest, we still find all of these cases of mini nukes lying here. The Brotherhood never comes to Fort Strong and occupies it, and they never remove any of these mini nukes. But I suppose they know where they're at when they need them. We could fast travel back to Fort Strong, but if we don't want to do that because we're encumbered or for whatever reason we have to cross the bridge and past Nordhagen Beach to wind our way through Boston's ruins and arrive back at the airport. Here we find the soldiers engaging in target practice. Remember your three C's. Cranium, front, center mass. And moving into the airport, we see that the Vertibird has landed. Like you gotta do it, Yeah, research patrol. <laughs> Babysitting field scribe. Prestigious. Beats guard duty. Why? What'd you get? Vanguard. You're kidding. Shipping out into the next rotation. I'll try to leave a couple of super mutants for you. Lucky bastard. It's this vertebrate we can use to arrive back aboard the Prid one. There's lots of ammunition and chems laid out here. A great little place to hit. And when ready, we can hop inside the vertebrate and take it to the Prid one. Back aboard the Pridwin, we can go into the command deck and tell Elder Maxon of our success. Outstanding work at Fort Strong, soldier. What happens at Fort Strong now? Paladin Dance is supervising the transfer of the Fat Man warheads to the Pridwin. They'll provide quite an edge to our arsenal. I've also ordered a detachment to occupy the location and use it as a staging area to protect the eastern side of the airport. All in all, you handed us quite a valuable location. Too bad it wasn't the Institute. Not to worry, Knight. You'll be dealing with them sooner than you think. Eh, it was a piece of cake. It was an honor fighting for the Brotherhood. I'm glad you feel that way. Because our mission here has only just begun. In order to bring the Institute to its knees, we need to use every weapon at our disposal. I try to supply my soldiers with the best. That's why I'm giving you these. Signal grenades can call a vertebrate to your location when you need aerial transport. Simply throw one to the ground, and the vertebrate will hone in on the unique electromagnetic smoke it emits. Once you're aboard, Use the map on your pit boy to interface with the pilot's navigation system, so he'll be able to take you wherever you need. Where can I get more signal grenades? I'd use the supply I gave you sparingly. These devices are far more complex than a standard smoke grenade. Should you need more, you should acquire them from Proctor Teagan. Will the Vertebrate stay and help me fight? I'm afraid I can't spare a fully armed gunship for this task. A standard transport will have to suffice. Of course. Nothing stopping you from using the door gun while in flight. The best weapon for survival out here is a pocket full of caps. Signal grenades are usually reserved for our paladins. In your case, you should be grateful that I'm making an exception. Thank you, Elder. I'll make good use of them. I expect that you will. Now, 
I'm sure you're aware that Fort Strong was simply the first step towards the liberation of the Commonwealth. An even greater task lies ahead. By now, I'm sure you've deduced that our arrival in the Commonwealth wasn't coincidental. We're here because of a unique energy reading recorded by Paladin Dance's recon team. According to our scribes, the reading indicated a level of technology that only the Institute could achieve. The moment this information came to light, our mission became clear. The Institute, and everyone responsible for the creation of the synths, must be eliminated at all costs. To accomplish this goal, we need to locate the Institute's headquarters. I've had our scribes meticulously searching the Commonwealth, but they've come up empty-handed. The only logical explanation is that they've gone underground. That's where we need your help. Can you take a look at these schematics? A scientist named Virgil said they could get me inside the Institute. I believe you'd be better served showing these plans to Proctor Ingram. That being said, I'm pleased that you've chosen to build the device with the Brotherhood. I might have a way to get into the Institute. I believe there's a bit more to the story than you're telling me. But based on your actions so far, I'm willing to take you at your word. Well, guess what? This is your lucky day. I have a way inside. The method is useless without the means to make it work. Perhaps... We should pool our resources to achieve our common goal. I have a way to infiltrate the Institute using a device called a signal interceptor. So it appears we share a common goal. I'm pleased that you've chosen to build the device with the Brotherhood. Now, indulge me for a moment by satisfying my curiosity. Tell me why you're so eager to get into the Institute. Aren't you the least bit curious what they have in there? Don't allow the allure of their isolation to cloud your judgment. I want to help the Brotherhood stop the Institute. It's the only way to ensure the safety of the Commonwealth. Indeed. The technology the Institute has at their disposal is frightening, at best. They've already done immeasurable damage to the Commonwealth. They killed my wife. The Institute will stop at nothing to further their own ends. I think they're the ones who kidnapped my son. The Institute preys on the weak to further their own ends. Together, we'll make them pay for their crimes. I'll call ahead and brief Proctor Ingram. Report to the airport, and get to work on your project right away. Remain patient, Knight. We're pouring every resource we have into the signal interceptor. At last, he's ready to help us, and he's making the signal interceptor the Brotherhood's priority. We'll be working closely with Proctor Ingram, and it looks like she's already headed down to the airport. Taking the vertebrate, we can arrive at the airport and move through it until we arrive at the garage door near the entrance. Here we find Proctor Ingram. Oh, this frame is driving me crazy. Got like three itches I can't even scratch. Elder Maxon said you'd help me build the signal interceptor. So, looks like you're calling the shots around here now, huh? All right, I'll bite. What does your new miracle device do? Did you know the Institute has a teleporter called the Molecular Relay? Take a look. Molecular... what? No. I'm not sure I can explain how it works, but a former Institute scientist gave me these plans, so... Hmm, let me see. You're supposed to be the expert. All I have are these plans. All right, tough guy. Let me take a look. The Institute uses teleportation to get in and out. This machine can hijack their signal and send me instead. Teleportation? Molecular transmission via encrypted RF waves? Okay, even I have to admit, that's genius. This explains why we've been picking up anomalous energy readings all across the Commonwealth. Not to mention how they get their tin soldiers to come out of the damn walls. And this little beauty allows you to literally hijack a return signal. Instead of grabbing the intended target, it grabs you instead. Impressive. That all sounds impressive, but can you build it? If I can keep that flying pile of junk in the air, I can work miracles. Enough with the technical talk. Chomping at the bit to get this thing built, huh? Me too. How can you admire them? They're a bunch of murderers. Whoa, slow down there. I want to see a huge smoking crater where the Institute used to be just as much as you do. But we have to take it one step at a time. Well, you definitely know your stuff. Damn right I do. It's difficult to make out all the details here, but I'm thinking you can get started by building a stabilized reflector platform. It's going to take a cargo hold full of high-grade metal, but I'm sure that we have plenty of it right here at the airport. Can you give me a list of what I'll need to build this platform? Of course. Just tell me what we need so I can get started. Sorry that I'm boring you. I don't see how this is ever going to work. It might look like a bunch of children's doodles to you, but trust me, there's a method to this madness. I'm glad you can make sense of those plans. I haven't made sense of all of it yet, but I will by the time you get the first part built. Here's a list of everything you need to find. 
You're also going to need a massive power source to get the signal interceptor running. With that, she gives us the document. Items needed, reflector platform. Here's what we'll need for the stabilized reflector platform. 10 aluminum, three circuitry, five steel. Proctor Ingram. Now we could build this at any settlement we have access to, but after joining the Brotherhood, we gain access to a new settlement here at the airport. It makes sense to build the signal interceptor here due to its proximity to the Brotherhood's Pridwin, and yet I found this location to be a bit glitchy, which I'll talk about in just a bit. There is plenty of scrap lying around so we can scrap some stuff to get all of the aluminum circuitry and steel we need to build the reflector platform. I built it on this red carpet, which becomes a problem later. Heading back to Proctor Ingram. Any luck building the platform yet? I glued a bunch of parts together and hoped for the best. Good enough? Hey, you're the one that's going to be standing on the thing. If it blows up, it's going to hurt you a lot more than it'll hurt me. No, not yet. According to Maxon, this is priority one. So quit fooling around and build it already. Yes. I'm ready to build the rest of it. Good. Let's move on then. Did you figure out the rest of Virgil's schematics? We'll know after we throw the switch. Here's a list of everything we'll need. Now, I know some of that might as well be in Greek, so I'll be around if you have any questions. Can you explain how this thing is actually gonna... work? According to Virgil's notes, it takes four components to complete the signal interceptor. First, we need a control console to input the code sequence and process the signal. That's the easy part. Second, we have the Relay Dish. That's for the interceptor part of the name. It scans and grabs the proper frequency we need. Third, and the most complex, is the Molecular Beam Emitter. This is the actual component that translates your matter into energy for transmission. You've already built the Stabilized Reflector Platform, which concentrates and reflects the Molecular Beam. I'm on it, Proc. I hope so. Wow, that's quite a list. Might take me a while to find everything. That's fine. It's gonna take me a while to figure out how to make this crazy contraption work. Looks good, Ingram. I'll get to work right away. Hmm. I wish I had your confidence. Oh, one last thing before I forget. It's important that all the components are wired together so all the pieces are on a single grid. Otherwise, this isn't going to work. If you need any help, I'll be over at the build site making some adjustments and calculations. I'd wish you good luck, Knight, but I think we're both going to need it. With that, she gives us the document, Signal Interceptor, Items Needed. There are three components you need to find. They're fairly rare, but I'm betting you'll be able to find them. Military-grade circuit board, try old military bases. Biometric scanner, hospitals, and clinics are your best bet. Sensor module, look in radio stations, radar sites, etc. Just stay the course and keep doing what you do best, Knight. Good luck, Ingram. Well, we already know from trying this with the Minutemen that we actually don't need a sensor module. But we can go track this stuff down all the same. The military installation they send us to, at least in my game, was Listening Point Bravo. If we go there and clear the place of its pre-war security, we find it inside a cabinet. For the biometric scanner, this time they send us to the Medford Memorial Hospital. We find it in a cabinet on the second floor. And for the sensor module, they again send us to Hubris Comics, and we find it in the same room where we found it last time. But remember, we don't even need this. Once we have everything, we can head back to the Boston airport to finish the signal interceptor. We'll start with the molecular beam emitter, but the problem here is that if we built the reflector platform on the red carpeting, the beam emitter won't snap to it. So we have to scrap the red carpeting beneath the reflector platform to get this to snap. Once snapped, we can build the control console, the relay dish, and then a bunch of generators. Then we wire it up the same way we did for the Minutemen. Now here's where I ran into a bug. Once the signal interceptor is built and powered up, Arthur Maxson comes to the site to talk with us. However, in my game, every time I tried to talk with him, he said, Sir, I'll send for you if I need you. No matter what I did, I couldn't fix him. I tried waiting several hours and even several days, and I got the same result. I can't talk right now. I have a lot on my mind. 
I tried using console commands to advance the quest, which worked, but we missed his dialogue. I tried loading a previous save and doing this all over again, and I got the same result. I tried building this at a completely different settlement and got the exact same result. Maxon's waiting to talk to you, and I'm not throwing the switch until he gives us the go-ahead. I'll send for you if I need you. Elder, I'm occupied at the moment. We'll speak later. This is a known problem, and I'm not sure if anyone has figured out what the problem is. I found many records online of people having a hard time getting Maxon to say the correct dialogue after building the signal interceptor. This problem doesn't pop up with Sturges and the Minutemen or with the Railroad. It's I'm just Maxon. To shoot this footage, I actually had to use one of my other characters and go through this whole thing on him to get to this point. For some reason, it worked with him, and I don't know what it was. I'm not sure what I did differently in that game save that got this to work right. But if we're lucky, and we can talk with Maxon... Remarkable work, Knight. The signal interceptor appears to be complete. Are you ready to put it to the test? You sure Ingram knows what she's doing? Proctor Ingram's managed to keep a 40,000 ton airship aloft for the past five years. I'd say that earns her the benefit of the doubt. Lab rat, standing by. All of us are aware of the risks you're taking. And we salute you. Thanks to me, yes. You mean thanks to you and Proctor Ingram. You may have done the field work, but it was her know-how that enabled us to decipher Dr. Virgil's schematics. Absolutely. I'm ready to go. Your confidence is an inspiration to us all. That being said, this is the first time we've attempted to directly adapt Institute technology. When we throw that switch, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. God willing, you'll end up inside the Institute, and the mission can continue. Unless I end up inside Solid Rock. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. I knew this was a suicide mission. Be proud. Your bravery in the face of the unknown exemplifies what it means to be part of the Brotherhood. Nothing's going to stop me when I'm so close to the answers I'm looking for. Eager to get inside, huh? Good. What are the details of my mission? I'm glad you asked. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. Once you've entered the Institute, we expect to lose contact. So it's imperative you remember everything I'm about to tell you. About ten years ago, the Brotherhood began recruiting civilian scientists from the Capital Wasteland to assist with various projects. During this process, we were able to obtain the services of Dr. Madison Lee, a noted mind in the field of nuclear engineering. That's fortunate. Yes, it was. How did the Brotherhood meet Dr. Lee? She was part of a civilian project in the Capital Wasteland that the Brotherhood appropriated. It wasn't difficult to convince her to stay. By recruiting, you mean they forced her to join? Being at war leaves little room for compassion. A nuclear engineer. Interesting. Securing useful resources during wartime is critical. That said, Dr. Lee's contributions to our cause were instrumental in maintaining order in the Capital Wasteland. After some time, she developed differences with the Brotherhood and exiled herself to the Commonwealth. We're fairly certain that her intent was to make contact with the Institute. What sort of differences? Although she was working with the Brotherhood of Steel, she never formally joined as a scribe. After the Capital Wasteland was secured, she objected to the Brotherhood's continued military presence there. I think she assumed we would just walk away from it all. She was wrong. Is there a point to all this? Just giving you the proper background, soldier. She was a valuable resource. It was a mistake to let her leave. Agreed. I wish our predecessors would have had your foresight. I'm surprised that the Brotherhood let her go. Had I been in command, I wouldn't have allowed it to happen. She was a valuable asset. Your mission is simple. Once you're inside the Institute, we want you to track down Dr. Lee's whereabouts. If you find out that she's still alive, make contact with her and convince her to return to the Brotherhood of Steel. There's a special project we're working on, and it needs her attention. What's this project that needs her attention? Sorry, that information is classified. I'm sure you understand. But if we pass the charisma check... Dr. Lee previously worked on a potent weapon for the Brotherhood of Steel. We'd like her to continue where she left off. That's all I can tell you. I hope this is worth it. If everything goes according to our plans, this mission will place us squarely on the road to victory. I want to know what to do if she refuses. Nothing that would provoke a hostile response. If she refuses, you're not to press the issue. Remember, infiltration of the Institute is our larger goal. Consider it done, Elder. Very good. Very good. Listen to me, Knight. I'm well aware that you're risking your life going into the Institute blind. Just keep your mind on the mission. And don't let anything they say sway you from your duty. Good luck. 
With that, we begin the quest from within. If we do this with the Brotherhood, we have to convince Madison Lee to leave the Institute and join the Brotherhood. Players of Fallout 3 will remember Dr. Lee as she plays an important role in the plot of Fallout 3. When ready, we can talk with Proctor Ingram. I've checked and rechecked everything. I think the signal interceptor is ready to go. Are you? Shouldn't we test it first? Not with a single frequency code. The second you arrive and the Institute figures out which signal we hijacked, they'll change the code and we're locked out. This is a one-shot deal. So what do you say? You ready to give it a try? I've got some things to do first. Yeah, I wouldn't be eager to jump onto this contraption either. I'm not ready yet. Fine. Wouldn't kill me to crunch the numbers a few more times anyway. Let's do this. All right. Head up onto the platform and we'll see if I can find a signal to lock onto. And with that, all we have to do is step upon the pad. But there is still one more faction in the Commonwealth that we can work with to get inside the Institute. In our next episode, we'll see what we have to do to get the railroad to help us build the Signal Interceptor. I publish new Fallout videos each week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxworn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members get little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos and access to ox emojis that they can use in my video comments and in the live chats of my live streams. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you soon with the next episode in the full story of Fallout 4. Throw the transmit switch. Transmitting in three, two, one. Stay safe, soldier.